Hi everyone, and welcome to Lazy Lion. Today, we decided to talk about another animated feature film that further helped launch anime into the West. We're talking about Metropolis. Metropolis was released in 2001 and has since been called a visual masterpiece. The animated film is an adaptation of the great Osamu Tezuka's manga by the same name, which was published in 1949. And Tezuka's isn't the only big name attached to the project. We also have anime veteran Rintaro as the director, who's previously worked on the Galaxy Express 999 series, along with anime legend Katsuhiro Otomo as the screenwriter, who most people will know as the creator and director of the cult classic Akira. Together, Rintaro and Otomo, working alongside Studio Madhouse, took one of Tezuka's early and little-known sci-fi works and turned it into a cinematic marvel for the world to enjoy. The story follows Kenichi, a young Japanese boy who travels to the opulent city of Metropolis with his detective uncle in search of a known criminal called Dr. Lawton. We soon find out that not only is Dr. Lawton indeed in Metropolis, but he's been hired by one of Metropolis's highest ranking officials, Duke Red, to build a super robot in the image of his deceased daughter, Tima. Fearing that his adoptive father might begin to love a robot more than him, Rock shoots the doctor before he can fully activate Tima and destroys his laboratory. Oh my, the drama. And it could have all ended there, only that Tima survives. When Kenichi and his uncle arrive at the scene, the whole building is up in flames. Running to the back of the building, Kenichi finds Tima, and he is able to pull her away from the fire and to safety. While doing so, the foundation around them caves in and they rapidly find themselves falling further and further down into the depths of the city, reaching all the way down to Zone 3, the lowest level of Metropolis, where only robots venture. As they try to make their way to the surface of Metropolis, they are helped along by a friendly robot and a group of activists. But it won't be easy. Rock, making sure to tie up loose ends, finds out that Tima is still alive and goes after her and Kenichi. It soon becomes a life or death race to the top. Like we mentioned earlier, the animated film is an adaptation of the manga Metropolis, created by none other than the godfather of manga, Osamu Tezuka. As a teen, Tezuka got the initial inspiration for his story from a still image he saw in a magazine that was covering Fritz Lang's 1927 silent film, Metropolis. After seeing the article, Tezuka asked himself, what would it be like to live in a city where in the future robots did all the work? And from there, Tezuka's Metropolis was born. And though Tezuka's manga has very little in common with Fritz Lang's movie, both Rintaro and Otomo decided to include certain elements of Lang's film into their retelling of Tezuka's Metropolis, such as including stronger themes of class struggle and inequality, while also further exploring the relationship between robots and their human creators, which Tezuka touches on in his Astro Boy series. The duo is also influenced by the sci-fi films Blade Runner and A Space Odyssey along with Philip K. Dick's novel, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? And whether done subconsciously or on purpose, if one looks hard enough, one can find many nods to those works, especially when it comes to exploring the themes of androids and self-awareness. Director Rintaro was always a fan of Tezuka's work, and was lucky enough to get to work at Mushi Productions alongside Tezuka himself where they worked together on the Astro Boy and Kimba the White Lion TV series. Rintaro later approached Tezuka about turning Metropolis into an animated feature film, to which Tezuka point-blank refused, possibly thinking his early works lacked merit. Metropolis was written as part of a sci-fi trilogy and was only the second manga produced by Tezuka, which he started writing at the age of 15 
So not sure we can blame him, just the thought of looking back at my earlier drawings and writings from when I was 15 brings about instant cringe. Gross. Moving on to Katsuhiro Otomo. Otomo has also credited Tezuka as an influence in his work, specifically those that fall within the sci-fi realm. While working on Metropolis, not only did Otomo and Rintaro decide to mesh Lang and Tezuka's Metropolises together, but in true Otomo fashion, he also decided to include various subplots that are based on historical events. We saw this in Akira and again here in Metropolis. In Metropolis, where society is mainly governed as a plutocracy, we see the people rise up against those in power. This brings to mind the French Revolution of the 1700s, and perhaps even the fall of the Kaibatsu, or financial clip, which controlled much of the empire of Japan until it was absolved post-World War II. The story also includes many Mesopotamian influences, such as the Ziggurat and the Tower of Babel, which is a great foreshadowing of what's to come. We also have the anti-robot faction called the Marduk, named after the patron deity of the city of Babylon. And lastly, we have Tima, who's named after a Mesopotamian queen. The music for the film was also an interesting choice, as they chose to use a mix of New Orleans-style jazz music with orchestral scores all composed by the famous jazz musician Toshiyuki Honda. And boy are we glad they did, because Metropolis has one of the best movie soundtracks around, and not just for anime. Honda really created a memorable soundtrack, filled with a lot of heart and emotion that tells just as much of the story as the visuals do. And speaking of the visuals, the diesel punk art deco aesthetic of Metropolis, which combines both luxury and modernity, helped create a retro look of the future. And the art deco style may have started in France, but it soon spread around the world. A fact that when applied to the movie, allowed the city of Metropolis to have a more universal look, allowing the audience not to focus on one place in particular, to instead focus on the future and the promise of technological progress. Which brings us to the anime production team who dealt with its own fair share of technological progress, when they used fairly new CGI techniques and paired them with cell animation, melding together both traditional hand-drawing techniques with some new cutting-edge computer graphics. By the end of the film's production, they had over 150,000 cells, with each cell roughly taking around two hours to paint. Which makes the fact that it took five years to complete the film come as no surprise. As we mentioned earlier, one of the themes that Rintaro and Otomo strongly wanted to include in their adaptation of Metropolis was class inequality. Metropolis is a large and shiny city that on the surface looks pristine and innovative and full of wealth. But what the leaders of Metropolis don't want you to see is that right under that surface there's another level called Zone 1, where the poor and out of work citizens have been forced to reside when they can no longer afford to live on the clean streets of the surface. And below that, there's an even lower level called Zone 2, with even more misery and darkness. And below that, there's an even lower level known as Zone 3, a level so uninhabitable that only robots could possibly survive there. Metropolis prides itself on being a world leader in industry, economics, and culture. But it becomes clear quite quickly that only a portion of the population gets to reap the benefits of such progress. And that's because Metropolis is run as a plutocracy, where the wealthy class living at the top have the power to rule the rest of society, while those living in the lower levels live in a pure dystopia. This unsurprisingly breeds malcontent with the masses, making it only a matter of time before the people call for a revolution and rise up against their oppressors. And no one even had to say, <laughs> let them eat cake. Next is a theme found in Tezuka's Metropolis. Tezuka ended his Metropolis manga with the line, Will mankind destroy itself by developing technology too far? 
a common fear echoed throughout the science fiction genre, where humans have been shown time and time again gleefully trying to see just how far they can advance technology, usually without giving a moment's thought to the possible consequences, nor realizing that it may in fact lead to their own demise in the end. The technology that Tezuka is specifically referring to in Metropolis, which can also be found in many of his other works, is the impact that machines and robots will eventually have on human existence. Will we be able to coexist peacefully and efficiently? Let's be honest, knowing human nature, the answer is probably a resounding no. But instead of presenting the audience with a scary and unstoppable robot army that is out for human blood, Tezuka, along with Rintaro and Otomo, decided to take a more humane approach towards the robots. In Metropolis, the robots aren't the monsters, the humans are. Which is why the story mainly focuses on them and the way in which they interact and treat their robot neighbors. Kenichi and his detective uncle are clearly the good guys since they interact with the robots in a polite and empathetic way, while Duke Red and his adoptive son Rock are obviously the bad guys since they show an outward hatred towards the robots and think them all beneath them, going so far as to hunt them down. And yet, we see throughout the movie that the robots, despite all this, are actually the ones with the most heart. Which makes it even more painful for the audience to see and witness their treatment at the hands of their creators. Just look at Tima. Duke Red commissions a wanted felon to build him a super robot that looks exactly like his deceased daughter. Already, this screams Frankenstein. But it gets even worse when Tima and the audience find out that Duke Red never created Tima out of love for his daughter but instead meant for Tima to be used as a super weapon in his bid for power, disregarding her whole being and sense of self. At her core, <laughs> pun intended, yes, she is a robot, but she was designed to look and act just like a human. And as the story progresses, even before learning the full truth, she constantly struggles with identity, not really knowing who she is, let alone what she is. This brings us to the theme of gender and gender identity, specifically concerning the character Tima. In Tezuka's original telling of Metropolis, Tima's character is named Michi, and she has the innate ability to swap genders at will, giving her a more fluid and androgynous-like self. In the anime adaptation though, Rintaro and Otomo made the distinct decision of making Tima female. Why the alteration? From what we gathered, this was to help convey her as a pure and innocent character. This is further aided by her almost translucent-like appearance, where she seems to virtually glow with an angel-like purity. This is further contrasted when she's next to Kenichi. Both appear to be around the ages of 10 to 12, and yet Kenichi comes across as being more worldly. Having recently traveled to Metropolis from Japan with his detective uncle whom he assists, he also actually has 10 to 12 years of life experience, whereas she only looks it, having only recently been activated. She also has no memory and very little understanding of the world around her. This further depicts her vulnerability, which paints her as a sort of damsel in distress, to be saved and protected. And throughout most of the film, she is quite literally being pulled in all different directions by those around her, either into safety or into danger, but never through her own volition. With Kenichi, she is expected to stand behind him and let him shield her from harm like some Arthurian knight, while her father, Duke Red, expects her to simply and silently obey and follow his wishes, blatantly ignoring anything she might say or want. In the film, this is in part because she is a robot, and Duke Red uses his belief that robots don't have emotions the way humans do as a way to justify brushing Tima aside. But we feel that her female gender is also at play, and is a commentary on how girls are viewed in the real world. 
The fact that the only other female character we see in Metropolis is a spineless handmaiden is, I think, a good indicator of how little importance women have in Metropolis. And in part, the future should women not be given more control over their destinies. Throughout the story, we continue to see how Tima lacks autonomy over her own person, leading to her experiencing a psychological breakdown. The only time we finally see her in control of her destiny and self is when she ironically loses control. So on that note, if you're craving a thrilling sci-fi drama with lots of action and adventure, and also happen to like Katsuhiro Otomo's work in Akira or Samu Tezuka's Astro Boy, then there's a good chance you'll also really appreciate a movie like Metropolis. Now, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to click that like button to let us know. And you can also hit that subscribe button for more videos like this. Thanks for watching. Stay obsessed.